Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's an honor to introduce Karen Liu. Uh, she's an associate professor at the Computer Science Department at uh, Stanford University. And um, she has moved a lot throughout the US. Uh, what do we just want? <laughs> started PhD at the University of Washington. And then I started as faculty at USC. And then moved to the east, to Georgia Tech. <laughs> And then this summer, she moved back to the West to Stanford University, almost as if you're still making up your mind. <laughs> um, so anyway, Karen works at the intersection of uh, robotics and graphics, which is a very uh, interesting intersection of disciplines. Uh, I would say um, even more especially today um, because of the relationship with um, the interest in uh, sim to real transfer, right? So. Karen is very well known for contributions in uh, um, generating realistic uh, graphics animation, re realistic human-like motion by embedding physical constraints or forcing graphics to obey physics constraints. And um, sort of that question of generating human-like behavior has a, uh, a natural follow-up, which is the same principles that we use to generate human-like animation, do they transfer to generate human-like motion in robots, right? And um, um, I, th I find it sort of uh, very interesting that some of those techniques uh, sort of can be used today and are extremely relevant to research today. And I, I hope that um, you're gonna, you'll talk about it. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks. <laughs> well. Thanks for the introduction, um, and thank you for inviting me over. It's a pleasure to come here to give a talk on how to simulate realistic human motion. So today I'm going to talk about simulating virtual humans, which is traditionally considered a computer graphics problem for entertainment application. So many of you probably seen this video uh, from the GDC this year. Hello, I'm Siren, and I'm a digital human. I was created by an international team of artists and engineers who wanted to challenge our ideas of what a synthetic human could be. So creating photorealistic virtual human is not a new thing. Computer gra pe graphics people have started this 10 years ago. And you've probably seen this uh, uh, digital, TED, digital dog giving a TED talk uh, this year, earlier this year. Uh, but what made this this video or this demo impressive to me is that everything you see is simulated and rendered in real time. And just let me focus on this real time aspect a little bit by showing you another clip where Siren was being interviewed by a real person in a live show in, at GDC. You hate the color. I hate it, but I. It's such a strong word. What's wrong with that? I think so. It's great, right? Oh, thank you. It's great. I love the red. But you can follow it. I, I prefer purple, but... You prefer purple? Like, yeah. Okay. Well, what should we make it purple? No, we can't do that now. There you go, it's purple. Whoa! How did you do that so quickly? Live in real time? Live in real time. It's 60 frames per second. Oh my goodness. Do you have hey, why, why don't we actually tell the audience a little bit about how I'm being rendered and sold live right now at 60 frames per second, as we said. <laughs> All right, uh, it looks great, right? But there's something off about this. There's something missing here. And the answer is, it's, it's the motion. <clears throat> so Siren is being driven by a real actress behind the scene being motion captured in real time. So all the natural movements and behaviors are coming from a live person. And um, you know, Siren is really just a dig digital puppet, if you will, and although it's a very sophisticated one, so <clears throat> when I saw this video, I have some mixed feeling, as you can imagine. Um, on one hand, I was really proud of my computer graphics um, community <clears throat> and what we can achieve today. But the fact that we still need a live person behind the scene to provide motion suggests that someone in this community didn't carry the weight. And that someone is likely to be me and my colleagues in character animation, right? <clears throat> Uh, but this also highlights just the challenges of uh, creating natural movements and unscripted behaviors. Because it really takes a multidisciplinary effort to make any progress here. So let's just start out with a sort of 
going through the process about how we actually mimic the process of a human generating movements today in computer animation. It always starts with a thought, with a high level intention, like standing over here, picking up a coffee cup, and then this thought is going to be turning to some, you know, neuron, neuro, neuro, neuron excitation, which activate muscles, and when muscle contract, it you know, it, it, it generates torques around joints. Together with external forces like gravity, we will go through a physics simulation process to create a, a joint configuration at the next time step. All right, so we have a process like that. And if you want to control this, then the first question you need to answer is, at which level do you control so that your motion will still look, will look uh, you know, uh, natural and human-like, but the computation is still tractable. In one extreme, one can choose to control the excitation of a billions of the neurons, but probably no one would do that. On the other hand, in, different ex in the other extreme, we can completely bypass physics and directly control the joint configuration at the end. And, but this kind of a kinematic control usually doesn't work very well if your environment is dynamics. So that's our first question to answer. Where do we control? And the second question is, how do we represent this, uh, this thought? computationally. We could literally represent as the, the full state at every millisecond by following some kind of trajectory. Or we can represent this thought as just an abstract goal without detailing how we going to achieve that. Okay. So let's examine this, uh, this, this space a little bit. The hardest part to achieve is this corner, right, the upper right corner. State of art, state of uh, state of art techniques still can control at the level of muscle activation to create complex motion without reference trajectory. On the other hand, most of the application you've seen for in entertainment industry can all be placed in this corner. In this corner, motions are generated by designed by artists or directly captured from the real world. It can give you really high quality motion, very natural looking, like the siren uh, demo I showed earlier. But this is at the, the, the cost of generality, because these characters or these agents don't really respond to physics changes in the environment, and they can't really do anything that's beyond what you describe in the trajectory. And the research that I'm more, mostly interested in, the region that I'm mostly interested in in my lab is, is this area. So what, what's special about this region? First, we don't depend on trajectories. We need to, uh, the agents need to be able to plan its own movements based on abstract goal. And second, we control at the joint torque level, which means the motion has to come through the physics constraint. It has to use physics to simulate motion. So with that, we're able to create a virtual agent that can respond to you know, uh, unplanned physical perturbation in the environment. We can also train an agent that can transfer a, poly, uh, a, a, a skill to a different environment. In this case, we use reinforced modeling to train the agent to ride a bicycle on a flat terrain and then we just uh, transfer that to a very different situation. Uh, our agent is also autonomous, meaning that it has to solve an optimization problem to plan its m movement according to some abstract goal. In this example, we uh, place the agent uh, in the midair and start with some initial random velocity. And the agent has to come up with a plan on its own to manipulate its body so it can land safely on the ground. In this case, the, the, the goal is really abstract. It's really just to say, don't die, and then the agent has to figure out. And in a different example, uh, so in, in, um, another thing that I want to I uh, focus is sometimes uh, trajectory, reference trajectory is not easy to get. So if we don't depend on trajectory, that really gives us a freedom to generate motion that, you know, where the trajectory is hard to come by. Like, I still haven't figured out how to do this in my motion capture lab, but so we end up um, learning from scratch using reinforcement learning. And in a different example, we um, try to teach agents to be modest, to put some clothes on themselves. And turn out this reference trajectory is also hard to motion capture because, um, you know, because of the occlusion of clothes on the human body. And come to think of that, that's the whole point of dressing, right? You are occluding your body using cloth. So uh, if we don't depend on reference trajectory, that means that the, the naturalness of emotion has to emerge entirely from the task and the, and the physics, which is pretty difficult. While there's a lot of uh, existing methods that demonstrate high quality motion by imitation learning or mimicking trajectory, 
we really believe that the, 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 the naturalness should be an emergent property in animal movements. So we propose to improve, to achieve the naturalness by improving the, the anatomical realism of the model instead of just reducing to tracking a trajectory. Simply put, instead of going left, we want to go up. So to be more specific, uh, most of the virtual agents in com computer animations are actuated by, uh, by independent rotary motors, very much like a robot. So directly controlled joint angle, joint, joint torque, is nice because it makes simulation, control, and, and modeling easier. But the motion we generated, generated are often being criticized as being robot-like, robot which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, right? So we hypothesize that um, the, the naturalness of emotion will emerge if we use muscle activation as actuator. And this hypothesis has been tested or been, been supported by previous work. People have tried to simplify muscle model on a re relatively complex uh, task or a full muscle model on a simple task. But you know, creating uh, or using full, using full muscle model to create complex motion without reference trajectory is still very hard today. And this, there, there are many reasons this is a really difficult problem. For one, um, our muscular system is highly redundant. We have more than 90 uh, on our legs. We have more than 90 muscles to control just six degrees of freedom. And every single one of those muscles will add some complexity to, to the dynamic system. So in a recent work, we are asking the following question. Is there a task agnostic approach to, gener to, to generate natural motion with comparable to muscle, full muscle model, but only using joint torque because it's simp simpler to model and, and faster to compute? And we want to emphasize the, uh, uh, the, 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 the approach that we're looking for is task agnostic. Uh, we want this, the, the space of actuation defined by anatomical model rather than what task you are performing. So in order to answer that question, uh, I, the first thing we want to do is just to formulate a very generic optimal control problem in the muscle space and in the joint torque space and compare the differences between them. Right? See if we can get some insight from that. So on the left, uh, we're solving a co-location problem uh, to find the optimal muscle activation trajectory A and the joint angle or joint, joint configuration trajectory Q. So Q is the final motion that you will see on the screen. And we want to minimize the muscle usage and the penalty, a task related or task relevant penalty term. This term could be very, very generic. It could be you know, how far you are away from the final joint configuration you need to be. Subject to articular rigid body dynamics, the muscle dynamics, and the bounds of the muscle activation and the bounds of a joint. So the last two uh, inequality constraints are basically just the, the bounds for the control variables and the state variables. On the right-hand side, we want to solve exactly the same problem but with different control variables. This time our control variable is a joint torque, tau. And here we're trying to solve, to, to minimize the usage of a torque and the same task relevant penalty term subject to articular rigid body dynamics, the bounds for the torque, and the bounds for the joint, basically joint limits. So if I, want to, if I solve these two problems separately, will I get the same Q? No, of course not, right? They're different, they're different constraints, and there's no reason to believe they will be the same. But the question I'm more interested to answer is, is there a way I can transform the problem on the left, the muscle problem, into the joint torque problem, an equivalent problem, so I can solve you know, in, in the joint torque space, which is easier to model, simulate, and control, but still enjoy the benefit of the muscle. Okay. Um, and, and of course, I will want the solution I get will have the same minimum as the, or the, the original problem before I transform that. So to answer that question, first let's just cross off all the terms that are, sim that, that are identical between these two, two problems. First, we, the, the task term is the same, the articular rigid body dynamics is the same, and the joint limits is the same. Okay. So what's remained is the differences between these two problems. And we identify the first difference is the 
uh, the torque bound, the joint torque bound. Because in the, on the right, you have this joint torque uh, formulation, which doesn't take into account the muscles at all. So you can imagine you can easily create some kind of torque patterns that are not possible to be achieved by muscles lies between 0 and 1. So that's the first difference. And the second difference is the energy assignment. You know, we're using this torque uh, energy uh, sum of torque square, sum of square of a torque, which doesn't take into account the muscles, and you know, your energy assignment will be of course, different. So let's first f focus on the, the joint torque limits difference. Um, if I were defending myself against someone bigger than me, in the self-defense class, the first thing they would teach you is to, to use this thing called arm lock technique. So basically, you try to figure out a way to put your opponent's arm behind his back. And anyone in that position will not be able to generate a lot of torque. Okay. So the first thing we learned, the first observation is that joint torque limits are state dependent. Another thing about our mus muscular system is that it's very complex. We all know that. But the, the muscles, some of the muscles can span multiple joints. And some joints have multiple muscles around it to generate torques. So the second observation is that joint torque limits also depends on other torques. What other, you know, how much you are activating other parts of your body will affect the torque limits at this current moment. So to be more specific, to make it more concrete, let's go back to our uh, the, the, the torque bounds we usually use. So this is like a box constraint, right? We have a upper bounds and lower bounds. There are just some constant values. So your, your constraint looks like a box. By observation one, we know that it has, should be at least that your, your, the, the, the true joint torque limit should look at least like this. It's a function, the, the bounds should be a function of, uh, of your state. But that's still not enough by observation two. We know that it also depends on torque. So essentially, eventually we use a, we, use, we define a implicit equation to define the range of a human joint torque limit. We hope this function C can capture some of the muscle capability, but only use the information available in the joint torque uh, formulation. So the next question is how do we define the C and how do we evaluate that? We define C being minus one if there exists a muscle activation such that the desired torque can be generated using valid muscles at the given state, Q and, and DQ. This is a famous forward muscle dynamics, uh, which uh, maps a muscle activation to its corresponding torque condition on the state. Okay? So how do, we, how do we evaluate this? The short answer to that is we use a software called OpenSyn. It's a uh, bio, biomechanically realistic simulation tools that allows you to uh, compute uh, this function for, for dynamics function. It's a software widely used in biomechanics since developing in, in, at Stanford. Well, so, but, but still, if you look at this, in order to evaluate this function, you need to solve a feasibility problem. You can relax that problem to an optimization problem, but still it's a very involved process, right? So we decided to approximate this uh, process of solving this optimization problem using a neural network. How do we train this neural network? That's a more interesting question, right? So how, who, who can provide the, uh, the training data? We utilize OpenSIM, a muscle-based simulator and model, modeling tools, to solve one million of those optimizations problems for me, for us. And we use a very detailed model to do that. So basically, we can train a classifier that's learned from a very detailed muscle, muscle model to do that. And it's also task agnostic, because when we sample the space, we uniformly sample in this R15 space. So with that, we can replace this simple box-like bound uh, with a learned joint torque limit C, which is task agnostic and state dependent. And the fact that this is represented by, by, by neural neck is great because you know, do, when you solve for your optimization problem or optimal control problem, you know that you have to evaluate the function, but you also have to calculate the gradients of that. And it, they can be both uh, done in a very efficient manner. Let's take a look at some uh, comparison. So here, uh, we, train, we want this agent to jump as high as possible. On the, the green agent um, uses, is, is, is constrained by the conventional joint torque limits, the box constraint. And the blue agent is constrained by the learned joint torque limits. Okay? So first thing you notice that, oh, the blue agent can jump higher, must be better, right? Because that's your, what you, you want to uh, optimize. 
But if you look at closely, uh, you notice that the, the reason the blue agent can jump really high is because it hyperflex it, its ankles. And why would it do that? Because when you, when you hyperflex your ankle, you can get lower, which will give you a longer distance to accelerate before we leave the ground. So the optimizer figured this out, except for nobody can do this. No real human can do this. When you're in that position, your ankle's in that position, you cannot generate torque. You cannot accelerate your center of mass that fast. And our uh, blue agent figured that out, the constraints, without using muscles. Um, so we compare this with the, uh, the muscle model. This is sort of like our uh, ground truth, our baseline. We solve this through uh, open sim. And we, you know, what we would like to see is that we can get similar motion without using muscles, but uh, with a better computation time. And in this case, we uh, have a little bit of safe because it's a very simple problem, but we can still save half of the computation time. Later on, you will see the, the save was a lot more significant when we move to RL. Uh, reinforcement learning. Um, and since our, our, our learn function C is task agnostic, we should be able to just apply this to a completely different task, and, which we did. So in this case, the agent wants to uh, accelerate as much as it can before it release the bar so that it can fly uh, further. And now you can see that for uh, the, the, the green agent is doing the same thing. It's, it overbends its knees and hips so that it gets a longer distance to generate torque, right? But again, you know, no humans can do that. When you bend, bend your knees that much, you cannot kick that quickly. Here's a comparison with the muscle model. And we see similar behavior and with a better compu you know, computation time. All right, so that's a question. Uh, so exactly this, uh, or uh, slightly different. Generic nonlinear uh, Yes. So it's a, it's a, we solved it. So this is not RL. We're not solving a policy. We're solving a trajectory. And we formulate it as a nonlinear uh, optimization problem. We're solving probably SQP. I, I need to look it up. But yeah, I need to look. To, to, to look. Yeah, so, so this problem is simple enough. You know, the local minimum is actually kind of what we want, right? We, it's not like we, we tune the initialization a lot. Initialization is really just the person stay there uh, over the bar, but, uh, lock, you know, but, but even with that. But yeah, in general, local minimum will uh, make, uh, play a, a role in this. But the, for, for a simple problem like that, we're not suffering by local minimum issue. Okay, so, uh, so that's the first part uh, I want to mention. And then there's, there's the second part, right? How about the energy assignment, right? There's not a, that's another reason that you will end up getting different trajectories because you assign energy differently. So I'm going to talk about this part really quickly because uh, there are a lot of things I want to get to later. Just to give you some motivation, uh, motivating example. Um, if I try to pull myself up from a bar and with my, my palms facing outward, that's called pull up. If I try to do that with my palms facing inward, that's called chin up. Which one takes more effort? I didn't know because I couldn't do either. <laughs> but my student told me one of them. Which one? Pull up or chin up? Pull up. Pull up is a lot harder than chin up. Um, so we know that the muscle-based effort is also state dependent, depending on what, you, you know, what your state is. But if you look at our current energy function most people use, they can't even tell the difference. If you do that for chin up and calculate the torque usage for chin up and, and pull up, you get exactly the same number. So uh, we need a better energy function, which is state dependent. And I'm going to you know, skip all the details how we formulate that energy function and just jump to the punchline. At the end, <laughs> we train a neural network to predict energy based on the, the state and the torque. And how do we train that energy or train that neural network, that regressor? We use OpenSim again. We learned this from a model-based, uh, bio, biomechanically realistic model and, and, and train the, the energy assignment from that, okay? And with that, you know, we can prove, we're actually proving the paper that we can uh, transform any muscle problem formulated in this way to an equivalent joint torque problem and reach a Q with a Q is the motion with the same minimum value um, comparing to the original problem. 
And now let me show you a little comparison uh, of using the energy function we learned versus the, uh, the simple uh, sum of torque square energy function. So the difference is more subtle here because this is the energy function. Um, but you can still see the difference here. Um, the, the blue agent has more passive movements in its knees. And this, this, this seems to confirm the biomechanical hypothesis where animal movements, animals tend to use a lot of uh, elastic elements in their body to save energy when generating torques. All right, one promise uh, that I, I kind of alluded to at the very beginning is the RL and thrust. Yes. Yes, correct. That's exactly correct. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't cover the details of that. Co-contraction is something we cannot do. And what we don't have here, or what the, the, the information we're missing here is the length of a muscle, right? That, oh, that also has its own, uh, you know, ODE to govern that. And this is basically what we call internal muscle state. And that's something that we cannot uh, capture right now with this model. And that's definitely something we're thinking about for the future work. Thank you. All right, so the, uh, for RL, so yeah, how do we apply the, the models we learn to RL? Yes, yes, yes. No, no. So C and E don't depend on task, don't depend on the environment. Um, but when you have a different task, you have to formulate your optimization problem differently, right? The task term will be different. And the contacts, you know, depending on what kind of contacts, you probably have to do that. So your optimization problem will be different, but the C and E will be the same. Does that make sense? Well, I guess if you're holding out a bar, uh -huh. Uh, okay, yeah, but they, yeah, if, if, like for example, if you want to simulate something that's not holding versus not holding, you will have different contact constraints, right? But, but it's, it's not C or E, well, yeah, we can, we can talk about that. Um, so RL, <laughs> there's been amazing progress in deep reinforcement learning uh, in the past few years. With the motion capture reference trajectory, people have done really good uh, job on you know, learning very complex policies, they can even do that with a muscle model, a full muscle model, if you have a reference trajectory. In the case without reference trajectory, you cannot do imitation learning or, or tracking, then it's a lot harder. We're still able to learn some reasonable local motion from scratch uh, through curriculum learning, but it's a lot harder. And then the, for, for muscle model, if you want to directly learn in the muscle space, um, the best we have seen is in 2D. So how can we use this learn joint torque limit C and energy function E to help RL? Uh, for energy function, that's easy, right? You just stick it in your reward function and replace your regularization term with, with this learn energy function term. For C, the torque limit, joint torque limits, we, uh, we use it as an inequality constraints in the physics simulation. So when your policy pro propose a tau, we will first check if it satisfies this inequality at all or not. And if it doesn't, then we will project your, the, the tau proposed by your policy to the boundary of this implicit function, which also make implicit function a good choice, right? Because um, it, it's a better representation for the function. So essentially, we redefine the action space uh, to be more anatomically correct for generating human motion. And with that, we're able to learn a few uh, local motion policies. I want you just to ignore the upper bodies. Upper body motion looks horrible. And can you just ignore that? <laughs> the reason I want you to ignore it is because when we learn C and E, we only learn from a lower body muscle model. And also, we don't have any terms to regulate the upper body movements in our reward function. So if we don't do anything with, uh, and just learn like a, the way we train a robot, this is the kind of walking you can get. It's not bad, it's walking, right? Uh, but if you just change your uh, reward function by using E and change your action space by using C, 
you can get much better uh, move movement. And if you directly learn from muscle model, we're not able to find any policy that can generate functional gait. And this is uh, for running. <laughs> All right. So uh, one thing I have not talked about is this uh, joint limits. And I'm going to just talk about that real quickly. Joint, turn out this box-like joint limits is also really bad. Uh, what I'm showing here is the uh, joint range of motion of a human shoulder. It doesn't look like a box. Um, so one thing we know that you know range of motion is definitely not like uh, your, your human range of motion is definitely not like a box. It's not something that box constraint can describe. Um, a second thing about our joint limits is that it's also state dependent. If you try to bend your elbows when your arms in front of your torso, you can bend almost 180 degree. But if you move your uh, arm behind your back, the range of the elbow is is highly restricted. So, again, going back to this uh, joint limit, what can we do with this, this box on strength? First thing we know, <coughs> <it's coughs> it has to be state dependent. But again, it's a much more elegant way to express this is to use an implicit function like this. How do we learn this function D? Well, luckily, this time we have real world data. Michael Black's lab at MPI has this really nice database with an extensive processing that captured from real humans. Uh, human athletes. So we learn our function D uh, through this, uh, using this, this data set. Once you learn function D, uh, how do you enforce that? For this, we have to enforce that in a physics simulation. You need to be able to use constraint force to calculate constraint force such that the next time step, your Q is still, uh, sat still satisfy the, 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 the inequality constraint by formulating this uh, linear complementarity program. More important thing here is this D uh, you know, being a neural network makes computing Jacobians very, very easy and, and efficient. All right, I'm just going to show some results here. Um, this is a complete passive agent. It doesn't have any internal forces. It doesn't generate any internal forces. It just falls on the ground under gravity. So on the right, this is how people usually generate ragdoll, right? They have this box constraints, like I talked about before. It doesn't look that bad. If it's a ragdoll, you know, you probably wouldn't notice, notice the difference. But if you use a learned joint limit, the motion looks a lot more human-like. And this is without any control. It's just the fact that you set the joint limits a little bit more human-like, you can get something already better without control. And now if you have this function D, it can be also really useful for solving inverse kinematics problem. Right? Uh, basically, it, it, your solution will be constrained in a set of a states, set of a poses that's human possible. So this is what we usually can get. And when you get something that you probably wouldn't even think there's something wrong about. But if you really think about what human can achieve, um, then you know, our model can correctly fail to reach the target because of the human limit. And one thing we uh, didn't expect at the beginning was this, uh, the, the benefit of the D beyond just you know, define a better range of a human motion. It also gives us self-collision avoidance. Um, when you do IK, you probably get this a lot, right? Unless you have a really nice cell, uh, collision routine, collision checking routine. It could be expensive sometimes you want to do it in the real time. Uh, but our, if you use D as part of your uh, constraints in, in solving IK, you get the self collision avoidance, self collision avoidance for free. And the reason is because when we learn this from the real world, no real world poses will go through its torso, right? So you just learn that automatically. Now, um, with the better replacing this, by replacing this with a better learned joint limits, we complete our framework uh, for biomechanic, more biomechanic framework for simulating and controlling human motion. To summarize that, the ingredients is to identify the three functions in the generic optimal control problem, replace them with three neural networks, learn from the real world data, or from a detailed biomechanically, biomechanically realistic model. All right. So this work was done by all these work so far. It's done by my student, Yifeng. He uh, was a master's student at Georgia Tech working with me, and now he's a uh, first year PhD student at Stanford. <coughs> so now we know a little bit about how to synthesize or simulating 
realistic human motion. How can we do, how can we use virtual humans for robotics applications? I can think of at least two places that virtual human could be useful. We can teach robots to move like humans, or we can, uh, you know, t you know, use virtual humans to teach robots how to interact with humans. Let's, let's start with the first part. Um, ideally, I would just like to build a virtual robot in simulation and train a policy and then just transfer it to that real world, right? That's the ideal situation. But apparently this doesn't work uh, for tasks that's com complex. And, uh, you know, so this means that if I want to ever want to teach robot to move like humans, I have to solve this problem we call sim to real or re reality gap. Basically, when you train a policy in the simulation, how do you, you know, deploy it to the real world? And researchers have hypothesized a very long list of uh, res you know, factors responsible for sim to real, sim to real problems. Uh, today, I'm going, only going to focus on this dynamic model discrepancy. This is one aspect of the uh, reality gap. Model parameters is a list of the numbers that define the dynamic models and the environment. Let's start with a bit, something simple. Suppose this is space of all model parameters. Every single point here is a model is a dynamic model. Given the robots and the simulators, uh, I can train an optimal policy for that point, right? For that dynamic model combination. But it's like the real world dynamics is likely to be different. So if I transfer the policy I learned for the green star to the red star, it's going to fail very quickly. In general, there are two ways you can think about to mitigate this issue. One is to train a robust policy that can handle a reasonable amount of noise and, and then transfer to the real world and hope it will work. Um, this works in some cases, but usually you know, your real world has to be somewhat, your simulation has to be somewhat close to your real world dynamics already. Alternatively, we could train a dynamic model using real world data and essentially want to bring the simulation closer to the real world. The limiting factors here is the amount of real world trials could be, a, could be large and it's usually you know, just more, more time consuming and more effort to acquire those, those, those samples. So we propose a different approach to tackle the issue of a dynamic model discrepancy. Suppose you have infinite amount of compute such that you can uh, train a policy for every single point in this space. Suppose further that you have a very fast algorithm that can tell you which dynamic, dynamic model matches the current observation of the motion. With these two scenarios, during real-time execution, all I need is every single time step, I look at the current history or short history of the robot motion, determine, select which dynamic model, and then apply the corresponding optimal policy. But in reality, of course, you can't do this. You cannot possibly explore the whole space and pre-learn all the policies. But with the advancement in deep learning, deep reinforcement learning, and physical simulation, it might be possible to train, to explore a, a, a continuous subspace that matters to your task. So with that in mind, uh, we propose a universal policy, which is, uh, which basically is, is, is you know, is a, is a policy trend under reinforcement learning framework. But it's different in that we also take model parameters as a part of the input. So we call this a universal policy because the action is conditioned on the dynamic model. Now the question is, uh, who is going to give you that value, right? Uh, we train another neural network that predicts these values based on the short history of a state and action pairs. We call this online system identification. Once they are trained, we, we should be able to apply this to a new environment that you've never seen before. Um, and it kind of works. <laughs> so we tested this on the uh, a simple you know, hopper, training a hopper that, that hops under, on, on a surface. It, it, it's unknown to it. So basically, the, the hopper doesn't know where the, 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 the friction coefficient is, what friction coefficient at different sections, and the hopper doesn't have any vision. Okay? So with that, the hopper, so, so hopper really has to use its, its, its history of its motion to identify the, the model parameters in real time. But we quickly realized that uh, this only works in a very simple case. The biggest problem here is this online system identification has to perform very well in order for this universal policy to be effective. 
So if you give this uh, uh, online signal identification with a, 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 a history they've never seen before, it's likely to make a mistake. When it makes a mistake, the universal policy would just be confused. Uh, you would be very suboptimal. So essentially, we're, 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 this is a zero-shot transfer uh, approach. Maybe we're too ambitious to think anything we train in simulation can be just directly applied in the real world without modifying using any real world data. Right. So this, this issue could be mitigated by a very simple idea. Um, most of the engineers start off their process with a system ID. Right? They, they identify a system and then they learn a policy. And system identification done this way is usually trying to uh, uh, you know, find mu, find a model parameter that best match the observation. Uh, and the observations are usually generated by some random policy. With the universal policy, uh, we essentially propose a re reverse order. Let's learn the policy first and delay this system identification uh, until the moment we want to deploy it to the real world or to, to a different environment. Um, if we can learn this, we can do system identification after the policy is available, then we can directly find a mu that maximizes the, uh, the performance of a policy for the task we really care about. Okay. So the, 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 the difference here, the biggest difference here is that we, uh, at the end of the day, this mu might, might not be the true mu, but we don't really care. We just want a policy to be able to perform well and forego the, 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 the mission of looking for the true uh, model parameter, which might or might not matter to the task. All right, so a quick illustration using my little diagram here. So remember this uh, black region is where the universal policy is trained for and the red star is the, the, the true uh, real world dynamics. If you're trying to match the, find the true star by matching the observation, it's very difficult. But if your objective now is just to find the mu that makes the policy work well, then it becomes easier in many cases because the, uh, uh, there, there might exist multiple mu's and your goal is to just find any of them and forego this quest of looking for the true red star. Right. Any of them will get your policy to do what the task you care about. So with that idea, we, tr we modify our online system identification to post-learning system identification. And during training, we just uh, train universal policy under a distribution of mu. And during testing, we um, use real-world data to directly optimize mu for the task. So with that, we're able to transfer a little bit further. We can transfer a policy trained from one simulator to a different simulator. You might think this is nothing, but there are a lot of differences between simulators. Uh, you know, because of the, you know, we, the DART is one uh, physics engine that we create in our lab, so we, we know the difference pretty well. Here's another example. All right, there's still a problem here. And the biggest problem here is this mu cannot be too high di dimensional. Remember, we're going to use the real world data to optimize mu stoch stochastically. And if a mu has more than five dimensional space, it, it's gonna be really hard to do. So instead, we will train a projective network together with the universal policy that map the, the model parameters to a low dimensional space. We call a contact space C and we call this projected universal policy. And during testing, we will directly optimize the C, find the optimal C that you know, make a projected universal policy work the best. And this time, after we've done that, we're able to finally transfer to a, a real world uh, hardware. This is a Darwin OP2. I uh, don't know if you have worked with that. It's not easy to work with, but it's, uh, you know, well, we can afford it's less than $10,000, but, uh, you know, it, it could be a very good platform for sim to real child because it's very challenging. It doesn't have a very good sensing and actuating capability. So nevertheless, we're still able to get Darwin to do something interesting. So this is uh, the first iteration after universal policy is being trained in simulation, but before it's adopted using the real world data. So what you're seeing here is the reality gap. Right. Like in the simulation I didn't show here, it, wo it walks fabulously going forward, but it doesn't work in the real world. But after 20 iterations, uh, we can see that the, the Darwin start to move forward. The universal policy is being fine-tuned better now. 
And by iteration, I really mean just like one sequence, one walking. So you let the robot walk 20 times, and it can do it, uh, which takes like around 15 to 20 minutes of training. We're also uh, able to get Darwin to walk backward. Almost. <laughs> and sideway. Yes, you can do it. Oh, yeah. So that's definitely some promising result, but we're still not happy with the robustness of our, our policy, right? And we're also thinking of some transfer uh, some, some, some bigger reality gap. We want to transfer it to something that looks even more different. One thing we noticed that the testing and training process are very different in our current framework. During training, we're training this projected network in this low dimensional space, the contact space. And, but this mapping was trained without using any real world data during testing. So this begs the question, will meta learning be useful? Can we expo expose our learning agent to the same process of a training and learning, sorry, training and testing, such that this, this mapping can be suitable, can learn something suitable for, for fast adaptation to, to, to new environment? So with that idea, we, uh, the, we, we come up with a very simple algorithm. Um, it's, it's very similar to the meta learning. Uh, here, instead of a, we simulate or we, we uh, sample the distribution of a model space, but you can think about this is like a task space in meta learning uh, analogy. So every iteration, we sample this uh, space of a model parameters. For every single sample, we fix the current algorithm, sorry, current policy, and look for the optimal C. And we do that for every single sample. And once we have a K pairs of a mu's and c's, we use the, those, two, uh, those pairs to update the, the gradients of the policy. And then we repeat the process. So now, with that uh, the algorithm, our training process looks like this. We are optimizing, op optimizing policy under the optimal c for a distribution of environment. And testing sounds like this. We are uh, executing the policy under the optimal C for the real world environment. So they, they match much better now, right? We're doing, we're training what we're going to test for. And that's sort of the idea of meta learning. And with that, we're able to use, uh, to train a quarter path to uh, move after, uh, I'm just gonna show that, 13 iterations. And we can also, uh, change the environment even more by weakening one of the motors of the uh, of the robot to create a three-legged dog, and the robot is still able to uh, perform the task successfully. This is a going uphill. All right, so this work uh, consists of four papers, uh, all from my student Wen Hao. He is a fifth-year PhD student, and he's going to uh, be on job market this spring. All right. So I'm also interested in um, using virtual human to teach robot how to interact with humans. Assistive robot has the potential to provide more intelligent physical assistance to people who, who need that, that kind of assistance. And uh, usually this, the, the designing controller is difficult because you have a humans in the loop and you also have to, um, and the humans are also moving oftentimes. And a lot of the interaction is through physical contacts. So my lab has been working on this problem we call assistive uh, robot-assisted robot uh, dressing, which is basically we want to do exactly this. We want to teach robot how to put clothes on human. This is a multifaceted problem, right? Because you have the joint optimization between humans and robots through another dynamic system, which is the cloth, and that's not. It's highly nonlinear and deformable. And you might think a cloth is harmless. You know, how can a piece of a garment hurt you? But a bad robot <laughs> can still use a garment to hurt you in a very uh, unpredictable way, let's say. So this is a, uh, a, a video of doing training. This is an early stage policy from reinforcement learning. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, this, nobody will want to put someone, you know, goes, going through this. So that there's definitely a value of using virtual humans to uh, do learning, especially one use learning approach 
to train robots. And another benefit of a virtual human is that you can model, you can modulate the kinematic and dynamic capability of a humans. In this case, we're train, trying to train ro one robot policy to, to interact with a wide range of human behaviors. Um, so this is, what you're seeing is the same robot policy, but when it's interacting with a weaker person, it has to modify its action. Uh, here is a slow motion. You can see that at the end, the robots end up doing most of the work for a person with a weaker arm. And similarly, we can uh, mo modulate this condition called dyskinesia. Basically, it's a, it's a kind of a tremor. Or uh, human or people with a limited range of motion. So besides using robot or using virtual hum human in place of a real human for training robots, we can also use virtual human to collect data for us. Right? Um, you know, vision perception is useful in many cases, but for dressing, it's limited due to the occlusion. But we can largely enhance robots' haptic perception. But essentially, we want to teach robots how human feels when the robot applies certain action to humans. And because robots don't come with this kind of common sense that experienced human caregivers have. So specifically in this project, we are trying to uh, teach robots or predict the um, or estimate the, uh, the pressure applied on the human limbs from the force and torque sensed at the uh, robot's end effectors. So we use a simulated results class simulation to generate a lot of training data, and then we train uh, a neural network to do this prediction. And here's the a quick result. On the left, this is estimated the result. This is a pressure map that robot think it, it's happening on human's limbs based on that three vectors that it sensed from the end effectors. And on the right, this is the ground truth. We call it the ground truth, but this is simulated result. Later on, we have a, a, a follow-on work to compare with the real uh, pressure uh, data from cap, uh, measure from the real world. We also extended the, our simulation framework to other activities of a daily living that you might want robust assistance. Uh, for example, drinking, bed ba bathing, feeding, as well as just general uh, manipulation of a human limb. Uh, one last thing I want to mention is we can also use a virtual human to train exoskeleton. Um, there exists a lot of assistive walking devices which um, you know, ease the burden of locomotion for people with motor impairments or, or older adults. And these devices have a sensing capability. They can sense the gait. It can also provide actuation around the hips. So our idea is to augment this device uh, for fall prevention. So what we would like to do is to use onboard sensors to, to predict the probability of falling at every single time step, single moment. If a fall is detected, we would like to use onboard actuators to modify the gait. Uh, maybe make the gate a little bit wider uh, further or make the gate make the person take the gate a little bit quicker so um, the first thing we need to do is to build the virtual humans that can walk with this device so this is a, a, a walking policy with wearing the device and this walking policy is really important because later on we're going to use that to train the exoskeleton so we did a lot of extensive comparison with the biomechanical data and once we're confident that this, this policy is similar to human's behavior, uh, we can first use that to collect a lot of data for training these fault detectors. And we don't have a problem of gathering a lot of negative e examples, right, because this is all in virtual. We can push human as much as we want and train a, a fault detector with a high accuracy. And after we have a fault detector, we can use this virtual human again to train a recovery policy on the exoskeleton. And here is the comparison. It's all in simulation. This is really early on work. We have not uh, applied this to the real exoskeleton yet. That's sort of the next step. All right, so I want to end my talk. Is about time? Yeah. I, with this uh, video I started, the siren demo, um, I know it's very controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think a computer graphic is quite ready in creating virtual life. But we still have a long way to go in terms of generating uh, you know, realistic and naturally intelligent human behaviors. <laughs>
And if you really want to do, you know, sort of get rid of this uh, Wizard of Oz behind the curtains, we have to rethink how, you know, what, what virtual humans mean to us. It's not just a digital puppet anymore. It should be an autonomous agent that can perceive the world on its own. With that, I'd like to thank my funding agencies and thank you for listening. All right. Any questions? Um, I'm just curious, for, for the um, exoskeleton that you were modeling and testing in that, what are its capabilities? Like, is it able to, you know, help an individual who, you know, to walk, yeah. can't walk at all to walk, yeah. or is it only a little bit of assisting at the hip? Or? Right, yes. So th this, that, that exoskeleton is a real thing. We modeled it off of a real exoskeleton designed by Steve Collins, which I heard that he was just here a few days ago, um, and we're working together now. <laughs> So uh, the capability of, so the, the design was to, so for walking assist, assistance, not for falling prevention. So they have a very, uh, they, 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 the, the exoskeleton itself can generate 200, I think, I, I, don't quote me on the numbers, that's what Steve told me, of tw the Newton meters. But you wouldn't want to do that on the real humans, right? So usually we cap it around um, uh, 25 to 30 Newton meters. So that's one constraint. Another constraint is that uh, you cannot change torque quick, too quickly. So the frequency of a control is also limited at 15 hertz per second. So those are sort of the, uh, you know, the constraint we had to work with when we develop policy. Yeah, I'll ask a question and then. Um, so. I was listening to you while you were explaining the first part of the talk, how you were sort of um, replacing each one of the constraints by a neural network that has been sort of populated with data mm -hmm. um, examples. And um, at the beginning, I started, OK, so we replaced that constraint. Um, but there's still a role for sort of preserving the structure, right? I, I might still want to enforce that I have torque limits. And then you sort of replace that one also by another neural network. And then the third constraint by another neural network. Um, which brings up the question of like, why replacing them one by one and not just like it's just yes. one full uh, yes. sort of constraint yeah. that yes. maps everything. Yeah, yeah. we actually tried that. Uh, and then as a uh, sort of baseline comparison with it. So the first thing, this is a, most people would just say, why don't you just train a function that maps the, the torque you use to muscles, right? And then I can just uh, uh, use that to simulate. Um, and then I can still solve my control problem in the torque space. Uh, first of all, this function is not the, is, is, is one to many mapping. So you can't really train a function to do that. Uh, you can make assumptions, like, you know, when the torque maps to, infinite number of activation. I only want the one that has the smallest L2 norm. You can make those assumptions, and then you can do something like that. So that's actually what we did when we want to create this baseline. Um, but at the end, it's still, uh, you, I guess the doing something like that, it becomes more um, task dependent because you can't really train with high accuracy when your output is high dimensional space. So, so, so the training is harder and you're, you're just training bigger space. And you, you might argue that I just have more data. And I think that that's probably true. You can solve that problem. But at the end of the day, the real issue we don't like is that you still have to keep two models around. You still have to have your skeleton, like you know, the, the articular rigid body, and the muscle model for your simulation and, and downstream tasks. Right? So what we really want is to just do everything in the, in the, in the articular rigid body space with the joint torque uh, activation and not to worry about muscle at all. So that that's hopefully answer some of your question. There was a question over there. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Um, so actually kind of connecting to the previous question, do you feel that this approach could naturally connect to understanding like better modeling the dynamics of objects, like let's say noodles in a bottle of soup or something like that? Or is there like a fundamental difference that you know that doesn't allow it to extend to that kind of environment? So let me see if I get your question. So you're, as, you're asking if this can be connected to objects, to understanding 
Sorry, I don't think I quite. This behavior is kind of like hard to understand. They say things are very deformable, and that we want to. Oh yeah, I I I, yeah I I think so. I, let me just complete the question you're asking a little bit. So let's just say if I do the same thing with objects, can I do this end-to-end -end learning versus something that I sort of replace, you know, component by component, just to because you said that it's related to the previous question. Uh, I actually tried something kind of similar to that too. Like you could just train, uh, you know, a, a neural network to predict directly next day. And a lot of computer vision people have done that, right? Um, and I think if, if your downstream task is really just to know, you know, this is gonna fall down or not, um, maybe you can do that. But if you downstream, if what you really care about is that state, whether that state you generate is actual or not. I think you, it would be better off you still keep this model, this physical model, as intact as possible, and then just replace the part where you think that, that data could be helpful. Give you a quick example, uh, a very simple example. It's like when we train this as a contact model, when we, tr tr when we try to improve our, our rigid body simulator, we only improve the part where that represents the friction cone because you know, we know that the Coulomb friction cone is an empirical model, right? So maybe you know, by just learning that part and then keep everything else is like a Newton dynamics still intact is a is a bad solution and we also show that it, it, it is indeed uh, the most generic way uh, to predict future. Thank you. We're going to Justin. That's a really great talk. Um, of course, in computer graphics applications, we don't really care about. Mm -hmm whether everything is perfectly accurate physically. Right. And maybe what matters more is plausibility in some cases, right? Like some of the motions that we saw like just kind of looked awkward, but of course physically they're, they're maybe better to realize. And, and in some animated environments, you know, these characters do totally non-physical and weird stuff, but when we watch the films, we're like perfectly happy to accept it. Mm -hmm. Is there any hope of like, in that sort of an application incorporating some term that measures like plausibility or I, I don't know the right, yeah, right. So, so um, <laughs> it, I, I think it's hard to answer that question, really. But I think when you get your model more accurate, the functionality or physics plausibi poss plausibility and possibility become closer. I feel like that that's probably the best I can answer that question. Like when something, when your model becomes, it, you know, just look at the, uh, the the blue agent versus the green agent, right? Uh, for blue agent, it's impossible, right? But that, that also uh, is aligned with possibility. Right? Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts regarding uh, some of the stuff they talked about in your second half of your talk. You had um, sort of these human agents, basically. You were going to address a person or whatever. Um, there's something that your simulator doesn't capture, and that's human intent. So when you're trying to dress a person, they will move in a, yeah. and it doesn't feel like your simulator can quite replicate that. So we we dodge that problem. Okay. <laughs> I don't like to do to model human intent because I don't know how to. So we really want to assume human is fully cooperative, and it's it understands the goal very well. It tried everything it could. He, well, I guess a human I can use a pronouns that's for human. He or she can to uh, to achieve the task. However, um, the capability is something that we have a pretty concrete measure for. So we wanted to measure the capability of a human instead of intention of a human. And I feel like there is more, there's more hope to do a better job with the capa modeling capability versus intention. A lot of people try intention too. You know, you can build model, you can you know, data-driven method, right? Like for a very specific domain, maybe intention could be model. Oh, so sorry. What I meant was more that the policy that you're learning for dressing a person. Um, is there much hope of actually translating that to a real scenario because the person might not behave the way that you're simulating? Right. Uh, well, yeah. yes, yes. I guess this is kind of related. To that. In that case, it, it's uh, <clears throat> you know we, we can't really do what we're doing now. We have to take into an, uh, account intention. I didn't show you one uh, demo that I had uh, in a, a different talk, which was a robot, PR2 dressing my son. He was four at the time, and. And you know, just basically, they, they fail immediately because they couldn't understand each other at the beginning. And this PR2 cannot see a boy this high, right? And then, you know, and then he was like jumping up and down to get a PR2 to see him. 
so yeah, so the the yeah, I, I think <laughs> that's sort of the outside of scope that we're doing right now. We first just want to figure out how do we even model the the true capability of a human. All right, I think we should continue on the other side uh, with the reception. Oh, many oh, more questions. Cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah.